Church, I titled the message this morning, The Parable of the Sower and the Seed, an X-ray of the human heart. If you have your Bibles and you're looking at Matthew, Matthew is 13 is the chapter with like seven of the parables. He, Jesus then all of a sudden threw them together. Anybody know what a, what a parable is? A parable is two heifers side by side, a pair of bulls. Some of you are just, go ahead and hit your, y'all you know what a, a paradox is. That's two physicians next to each other, paradox. I better stop right there. That, that was too many bad, too many bad. Okay. Okay, Danny, I'll stop with that one. That was pretty bad. But a parable basically is a, somebody said it's a, uh, what? A, a, a heavenly, a, a earthly story with a heavenly message. In a lot of ways you can, you can define it. But basically Jesus, and he tells this, and, and there's so much good stuff in there, and, and I can't elaborate and break down every verse and, and make this a two or three hour seminary classroom because that's not what this is. Um, but Jesus spoke in parables. He tells you, look at verses 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I, don't put it, I didn't have it put up there, but he basically said, for people whose hearts are hard. Because when I would speak, he's saying, they don't really want to listen to me. So I'm going to couch it a little bit. I'm going to disguise my message so that the average person that really wants to just go home after this and not look it up, then my truth will be hidden from them. So if you're looking at your verse 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, that's what he's telling you. That's why he spoke in parables so those of us that are saved that we'll come seeking it out. You know, we'll come searching after it. Uh, I, I'm not a gold miner, but I'm just assuming that I'm, if gold doesn't just lay on top all the time in Africa. It's just, it's just there for you to walk in, just pick up and put it. No, you, what do you have to do? You got to go in the mine and you got to get your hand. You got to go in deeper and deeper and you got to chisel away and chisel and chisel. Whether you're, or in California, you got to sift something that that's valuable. Guess what you'll do? You'll go after it. Like when Joanne shot me down in my seminary days, I thought, I'm not giving up on that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that, I mean, I, I'd be stupid if I would, right? The worst you can do is keep telling me no for five or ten years. But if it's that worth it, guess what you do? You, you go after it. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. So I just gave you a synopsis of about verse whatever, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And so Jesus shares a parable here, and I'm going to cover this one this morning. And it's, it's about the parable of the sower and the seed. Anybody ever taken a, uh, of course you have, group photo, group photo, maybe your senior picture, right? And it's, depending upon the size of your high school, uh, I went to one of the largest high schools in, in the nation. I think it was second largest, but I moved away after my freshman year. But I seen the, the senior photo, and it's crazy. We were over 5,000 students. It's crazy. It's a long story. But here's the truth. When you have a group photo, whether it's an office picture or whether it's your... Um, Maybe a family reunion and it's Christmas and you got all, you know, 30, 20, 30, or ever many might be there. When the picture comes and you see it, it's sent to you on Facebook, tell the truth and shame the devil. Don't give me this Jesus answer. Who's the first person you look for in that picture? Come on, tell the truth. And don't say, I look for Jesus, because Jesus ain't in that picture. The first person you look for is who? It's me, right? There was a... a What's his name? He's a country singer. I liked him. He was pretty good. He just passed away because I heard his testimony. He'd given his life to Jesus. His, Toby Keith. And he wrote a song called something about, uh, I want to talk about me, want to talk about. I loved it. I heard that years ago. I thought, that's a funny song. But I thought, but he's right. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I just want to talk about me. Well, all that to say is in this, these verses right here, you're here. Every person in this room is in one of these four categories. If you'll look, you'll see yourself, and hopefully you'll see yourself in the right uh, category, all right? Or if I could give you one more, wasn't there a famous uh, book called Where's Waldo? All right, well, where's Waldo? You're there. Let's see if the Holy Spirit will show you where you're at. Jesus shares a story, and he talks about a sower and he talks about a seed, and he talks about a ground. Let's just kind of define it real quick. The sower in this uh, passage is probably, probably God, Jesus, or it also could be us, 
those of us as believers that we're what? We're sharing, hey DJ, we're sharing Christ with other people. We are sowers, not what you ladies do. You know, when you rip your dress or something, you sow. This is a sow into the ground. So there is sowing and then there's the seed. What is the seed in this? Is this Johnny Appleseed? No, the seed is what? This is the Word of God. That when you're ministering to people the truth about Jesus, that's the seed in this passage. And the ground is what? That, that's our heart. That's what Jesus is talking about this. This is, this is the state of the human heart. And Jesus just puts it like it is. So that's where we're at this morning. Let's jump in and let's break this passage down into the four categories that it is. And the first one is right there, beginning in verse 3. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the birds came and what? Now, the first type of people, he says it's by the wayside. I don't know, if do I have a PowerPoint? Is that one where Jesus is walking in the fields and... Uh, a lot of times when they would, uh, in agrarian society, uh, heavily agricultural, they didn't, it wasn't the machine age or the industrial age. So people existed, for the most part, off the ground. So when you had a field and you were growing whatever you were growing, it was not unusual to cut a path so you didn't have to walk 500 yards this way and around and around. We do it sometimes if you'll go to a, a, a public place and you'll see grass some people take. And then, and then all of a sudden it's now a beaten path because people don't want to have to walk all the way around. Well, if you look at that, Jesus is walking and, and they would cut through. And at that point when someone trampled on that grass and then another person and another person and another person, you'll see where Jesus is walking. It's no longer tender and soft grass. It's now what? It's now hard. And you can see Jesus as he's ministering truth to people. He throws seed down and some of it falls on ground that it's called wayside. It's been packed. It's been packed hard by people kind of walking on it. Your heart can become hard by allowing people who have walked on you, just like this morning, it sounds like several people were sharing Tawana and Pam, that your heart, and you can put on a good front, and you can smile because you know that's the professional thing to do, but deep down you know you're, there's, a, there's a bruise and a hurt that just hasn't gone away yet. Well, Jesus is saying that when he throws the word down, that these kind of people, when they hear about Jesus, Jesus is love, Jesus wants to forgive them, God would want a relationship with you, how do they respond? Well, they respond in many ways, but none of them are positive. They might respond by saying, uh, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I don't need forgiveness like you guys need forgiveness. This Jesus is for weak people. Hey, I'm sharp. I don't need a crutch in life like you guys that are very emotional and you need something to help you cope in life. These people, when they hear the gospel, some of you, you're married to a person like this or you have a child or a grandchild or a parent and there is not an openness to the gospel. Their heart is very hard and they will tell you. So these people are normally pretty easy to spot out. They're probably not a regular church member, though they could, but for the most part, if you drag them on a Christmas or Easter, you've done well and that's enough for them. What they are saying is basically, thank you for the life that you've given me, but I am not giving it back to you. I will live it the way I want to with the time and the money that has been given to me. And he then explains, and this is the only parable that Jesus rarely fully explains the parable. So look what he says then. Uh, after he, he shares, uh, look at verse Oh, I'm, st I'm uh, stumbling here. Where is it at? Verse, uh, somebody remind me to get a new Bible. My pages are so crumpled, I don't even, I can only read half the page. Uh, it is verse, uh, where, where is it at? Is it, 
Because see, all my numbers are gone. There's no more numbers. <laughs> what is it? Thank you for <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> I, okay, a little side note. I have been for years needing to switch Bibles, but I have so many notes and things that I've written in over 30 years that uh, I know that I, when I do it, it'll take me forever to get another. So, anyway. so I have to kind of guess what, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what the verse is, roughly. Uh, four, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys, four. And then he explains it. And he says to them, uh, where's it at? I need glasses. Oh, no, okay. Let's, let's go to the next slide. There you go. 18, that's what I meant to say. I thought four, I, I just did four. 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sorrow. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and he doesn't want. What's that preacher talking about? What's my wife talking about when she's trying to tell me about God? They don't understand. It doesn't make sense to them. I'm a pretty good person. I don't need this Jesus person. You're just, honey, you're just a weak person. Kid, son, you're just, you know, you don't have it together, but your dad is strong. Your mom, whoever this person might be, they don't understand it. They can't figure out how that would apply to them, nor do they want to understand it. And this is what Jesus says, kind of sad. Then the wicked one. Now, if you'll look, because the Bible will sometimes, okay, this passage is three times in your Bible. Matthew 13, and then Mark is your next book, chapter 4, and then Luke chapter 8. You'll find this passage three times. Each Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they tell the story, sometimes they'll just add one or two more lines. In other words, if Jesus preached this in Elizabethtown, then he preached this in Owensboro, and then he also preached it over in Ashland or Paducah, he's probably not going to, he didn't have everything perfectly written down. They repeated the same exact thing every single time. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke would remember what he would say, and each one sometimes just through a little extra thing they remembered. And so one of the, uh, uh, Matthew, one of them says, it, it, uh, the wicked one, or when it talks about the bird, it defines the bird as being Satan. Someone speaks to you about Jesus, and you tell your spouse, or you tell your parents, oh, you know, that's just for my old-fashioned parents. Whoever it might be. That's just from my friend. He was hooked on drugs, and he needed, a, he needed a, 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 some sort of crutch to help him off of his drugs or alcohol. And so what they do is they harden their heart. And when they do, when you put that grass right there, let's go back to that picture uh, there on that frame where Jesus is sowing seed. When that seed, that truth is being thrown on this kind of person's heart, look at that. Look what starts kind of flowing in quickly. And they get it right there where that ground is hard. And before the end of the service, you couldn't care less about God. All you care about is beating the Methodist to Golden Corral or watching the score of UK versus U of L. And that's just the truth. Your heart is hard. But the great news about this, it doesn't have to end there before the end of the service. It's just that's where you're at now. You've allowed your heart to say, man, I'm, I'm cool and I'm tough and I can make it in life and I can pull myself up by the bootstraps and I can get a good paying job and I and I and everything is I and I don't need God like those of you that are weaker. That hard heart there, so in your outline, the wayside is it's a heart that's chosen to be hardened. You've chosen that. In this passage, you can't blame the sower. You can't say the church did this to me. The church did that. When I was young, it doesn't matter. It's still the Word of God presented to you. And nowhere is the sower of the seed at fault in this passage. The problem always lies with the human heart. I don't care what they did to you. I don't care if somebody did the most gross thing to you in the name of Jesus and they call themselves a Christian. So, so Satan masqueraded in that guy who claimed to be a believer, did something wicked and awful, and so that's now your excuse to not love God and be loved by God and be forgiven? It makes no sense. 
except to you, you want to justify why you don't want to know and serve God and be forgiven. So the wayside is a heart that is chosen to be hardened. A hard heart is one with no desire to seek after, to know, or to please God. You might come occasionally out of politeness, but when that seed is being thrown on your heart, Satan quickly comes and you give him root by saying it's all this or that. And by the time you're home, that seed is gone out of your heart. Now, I don't like that one. That's just so harsh and firm, but that's the word of God. Let's go to the second one. Let's go to the second type of seed here in this passage. And look at that starts with verse five. Where it says this. Um, I think I've used this illustration a year or two ago, but it's worth using again. I remember I was preaching in the street ministry over 30 years ago, at the homeless ministry in Fort Worth. And uh, at the end of the service, a man came forward. He stood out because he was a doctor. You don't have a lot of doctors doing street ministry, right? And uh, he was one of our uh, seminary students. We had about 20, 25 of us that, that were leading out of the street ministry. And he was one of the, the, the ladies in our group's dad. And he was visiting from Mississippi. And he came up to me and said, hey, you listen, what you shared today really spoke to me. Can we get together in the back room and talk? I said, sure. So we start talking, and he's obviously a pretty intelligent guy. And he's asking me all kinds of questions, and I'm, I'm firing back with answers every time. This is why Jesus is Lord. This is why it's only faith. And, and he's asking, and I'm responding, and he asked about every question possible. And, and every time God responded to him with an answer, and when he, I said, what are the questions do you have? He said, that's about it. I said, then what's keeping you right now, sir, from giving your life to Christ? And I'll never forget this. This was over 30 years ago, but it, like it happened last week. He said, um, I'll never forget it because it was also a special Sunday. It was Super Bowl Sunday. And the only reason I know that because he told me. He said, let me go home and watch the Super Bowl and think about it, and I'll get back with you. I talked to his daughter, who was every week with us during uh, doing the street ministry. Talked to her weeks and months later. Said, whatever happened to your dad? Did he ever get saved? And you know what she said? No. <laughs> right there. The seed was planted right on his heart. Every objection he had to why Jesus alone was Lord. We could only be saved by grace through faith. And then when he walked out of there... But I, my heart's hard, man. I, I don't want to give up all this money I'm making, and I don't want to do mission trips. Here's the second truth. Let's look at uh, these verses here. And some fell on stony places where they didn't have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth. I think that picture, the next one I have, uh, show the next one. And it's the second one. And it doesn't focus on the birds as much, but if you look real closely, do we have one with just uh, uh, that verse? Yeah, we're at there. If you look, the focus, you'll still see the, the birds coming, but look where Jesus is walking now. Verse 8, but when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, what happened to these seeds? They what? They begin to, to wither away. Let's look at this truth, and let's talk for a moment. These people are hard to detect that, that they're lost. For the average church member, they'll say they're saved right off the bat. Then they're saved, they're born again. Look at their response. Look at this closely again. And some fell on stony places that didn't have much earth. So I'm not a planter. Look, some of you are. But if you were to have three or four or five inches of good, solid dirt, but underneath it, there's a, there's a, a layer of rock all the way. When that root starts going down and it hits the rock, what's going to happen? It's so it's going to spring up, right? It's, it's going to spring up for a little bit. It's going to look like, wow, look at this, man. This, this was quick. But look, this, look very closely. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of the earth. But when the sun started coming up, it scorches that little plant. And because they have no what? Root what? Look at the... Look at Jesus' answer. Look at verse 20 now. I think I have on the same slide. Look at that one. Look at verse 20. Then Jesus explains. 
But he who received the seed, and he had stones in his heart, right? It wasn't compacted like the first guy. This is the guy who hears the word of God and what? Look closely. What did Jesus say about these people? They want? What did Jesus mean by that? Well, they were a nerd in school, and they kind of weren't accepted, and they heard that Jesus loved them, and guess what they said? Wow, somebody will love me. They were going through a divorce, and they were feeling rejection, and they go to a church, or you witness to them at work, and they hear that Jesus loves them uh, different from their spouse, that's good news. They're struggling with alcohol. They're struggling with drugs. They're having financial problems. They got a loved one in the hospital with some serious illness or disease. They're facing a a court case where they could be locked up for 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And hearing that Jesus might get them off, guess what? That's good what? That's good news. (laughs) They're at a low place, and they hear, and they receive that word with what? And you're saying, he's saved. They got saved right there. Look at that. Look closely. Yet they have no what? Do you know what it means to be emotionally saved? See, a lot of, by the millions in churches, we have people that are emotionally saved. They're wounded and bruised by life, and they want Jesus to be their Savior. They don't want Jesus to be their Lord. And if He'll heal me from my hurts, I will take that. But don't talk about me having to bow my knee and to serve Him every day of the rest of my life. And these people hear about Jesus, and they receive the word of God with joy. But the bad thing is that it, it doesn't last. And, it, and it'll begin to even tell you. Look very closely, verse 21. Yet he has no what? doesn't dig into the word. He's very superficial, very shallow. Yet he has no root in himself, 21, but he endures... This Jesus stuff, this church stuff lasts for a short while. He endures only until that sun comes up and begins to scorch it. Right? Because he can't go down. There's no depth. There's no, like the water, the the word of God is like the water washing me. And and there's none because he's got that stone he's not getting rid of. But only for a while, for when two things, three things come up. For when one... Tribulation or what? What's the difference? Tribulation is going through a difficult time, right? Tribulation, I'm going through a time where God is testing me and he's, he's seeing, am I really going to seek him no matter what? Persecution is with someone personally, then what? Comes against you, okay? Tribulation is I'm being tested, right? Persecution is someone personally coming against you because you're a Christian, Now, if you're being a jerk and self-righteous at work, oh, brother, if you're smoking, you're going to hell, and someone jumps on you, you deserve to be jumped on. You're being a jerk. You can go to heaven and smoke cigarettes. It'll just make you feel, it'll make you smell like you've been to hell already, but I mean, it doesn't mean you're not saved, and I'm not encouraging people to smoke, but that's not our job to run around at work and blast people because of their, their, their habits. They need Jesus. You can get them to vote for the right political party and they're still going to hell voting for maybe the better candidate. That's not why we're here as believers. So there's tribulation you go through. Wait a minute. I was told that if I gave my life to Christ, I could just declare it. I was not going to have no problems. That's what Jesus did on the cross, right? And that's what John the Baptist did. And that's what every godly man that went through unbelievable trials. And you will go through them if you're a believer. You will. I don't care how much faith you have. In fact, oftentimes, the more faith you have, the more problems you'll go through. The more you'll be opposed. So when tribulation or persecution arises, but look closely what Jesus said. That persecution in your life, the tribulation arises because of what? Because of the Word. Because you're standing for Christ. 
Because you're saying, hey, I'm going to do what the Word of God says. While I read something, I'm not going to mention his name. A lot of you, if you've been Christians for a while, you probably will know him. But I want you to focus on the illustration and not the guy. He pastors a huge church out in California. I'm going to just read what he said. I remember he said uh, years ago, a man came to our church and was one of the leading producers of films in, in Hollywood. Except his films was pornography. And he says, and he confessed Christ. It was an exciting time for us at the church to hear his testimony. And he says, and I brought him after he had given his testimony of faith in Christ and had come to church for a few weeks. He wanted to be baptized. And this pastor said, I had the, uh, the privilege of baptizing this guy who used to produce pornographic films. And so, oh, okay, let me keep going. Now, if if you've made a fortune as a producer of pornographic films, it's a little hard to send out your resume to get your next job. Hey, what have you been doing the last 20 years of producing pornography? Yeah, come on to our family, uh, family feature program films and come be part of us. So because that was his background, now he's putting his resume together and they're asking where you've been and you have to be honest. So guess what? He had a very hard time doing he had a very hard time finding a job and this is what it said he couldn't make any money and it wasn't long before he was back doing what he did and he went back so God tested you is it okay to live on less money than you're living how about if you're just going to barely make it? is that okay if you don't get hired to do what you're doing and you're going to get a job someplace and you might only have to live on 40 or 35 or 40, 50,000 a year or 25,000. And in this guy's case, you know what he said? No. See, Jesus said that uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. See, my job is to do God's job. God's job is to take care of my needs. Basic truth that very few people ever get. My job is not to say, well, you know what? I'd love to be at church because of this and that, but it's Sunday and I have to work double time. And all. No, my friend, my job is to do God's business. Seek first the kingdom of God. God's job is to make sure that I have enough money coming in to pay my bills. He'll meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He won't meet all of my greeds according to my riches and glory. And so this pastor said, this guy, all excited, that all of a sudden when it was tough to make money, you know what, I always wondered, was the next day the day God was going to give him a good job? Was two days from now or five days from now? Or was God trying to say, you know what, you're like the rich young ruler, you love your money, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait you out and not have an offer until you learn how to live on a lot less and let me be enough for you. Amen. And the average person would have said, this guy is saved. Endures only for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, guess what? He stumbles back away. Here's your second truth in your Bible. Stony places, this ground that has hard rock between, your surface, between the surface, they fall away due to tribulation and persecution and the cost of following Christ. To follow Christ, there is a cost. That doesn't save you. But that'll prove whether you are saved. There is a cost to follow Christ. There is a cost. You can't have Jesus and do your own thing all the time. Then, my friend, you're your own Savior and not Jesus. Many people think they're saved like this. And we say they're just backslidden. Oh, that's my kid. They're backslidden. And then we got a whole nation of backslidden people. Are there some backslidden people? There are some people that really got saved. But my friend, if you're telling me you said a prayer when you were 17 or 22 and you really got saved and 30 years later you haven't been to church, I wouldn't say you're backslidden, my friend. You never, ba you never front slid. To backslide, you got to front slide. you got to at least have walked with them to where it looks like, doggone it, you might have really been saved. So the majority of these people we say that are backslidden, my friend, they never got saved. Jesus is telling you right here. They received the word with joy. Man, they got excited. Jesus let them off that jail sentence. And then a couple of weeks later, guess what? Right back to doing the same thing. 
Here's the third category, and this one is uh, this one's even more difficult to kind of to pinpoint. This kind of person. Oh, do I have a scripture verse? Did I have John six up there? There's so many good verses that go with this one. On the one before, uh, did I have John six up there? Did I have up there? Okay. If if you find it, tell me. yeah, there it is. Jesus preached a very tough passage. I've shared this a couple of times over the years. He preached a total, a, a very, none of the silly stuff we're doing in our modern church today. We're just really tickling people's ears. And, uh, well, we're a church of grace. Well, my friend, be a church of everything. Be a church of grace and truth and holiness and purity. I don't want just to be a church of hope, right? Hope is important, but there's other things other than hope. And, and so, long, long story short, Jesus preached, uh, he says, you got to eat of my flesh and what? Drink of my blood. Hey, this is not just saying a prayer. You got to take all of me. And they were finally understanding what Jesus was saying there in John 6, 60. When he preached that tough passage and didn't back down, then you know what a whole bunch of church members did? See, it would make me feel better about myself if many of you got up and left when I was preaching. That means maybe I'm doing my job right. Maybe I'm telling you the words so directly that you're offended by it. And you're saying, how dare him say that? And I would say to you, how dare you go against the word of God and say you're right? How can you sit here and say, how dare me? If I'm reading the word of God, I would say to you, how dare you say that you can be saved and do it in another way other than through the blood of Christ? And many of his disciples, when they heard Jesus preach this tough message, what did they say? This is what? That's a, you're asking a lot, Jesus. We thought we could just say a prayer and join a church. That's a hard thing you're asking from us. Look at that. Who can grasp it? Who can fully understand what you're trying to say to us? You're saying it's more than just prayer, prayer that we got to give our whole lives to you. We got to take your, your flesh and, 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 and drink your blood. That sounds like a cannibal. And, and so they fully grasp what he's saying. And then look at verse 66. From that moment on when Jesus, oh, they loved when he was healing the sick. They loved him when he was multiplying the loaves and the fishes. Well, that got a big crowd, right? Everybody loves a good freebie. If, if, if Texas Roadhouse, Roadhouse had a free meal for you and your entire family, for, even if you're not a father, you could cross-dress and be a lady. Okay, just being, all right, just silly, being silly there. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. But a free meal. You know how many people would line up at Texas Roadhouse? I'd go, shoot, man, I'll beat you down there. In fact, I'd let Dwayne finish the sermon. I'd hop in my car. I'm on my way. <laughs> so from that time, many of, not one or two, guess what? Many. A whole bunch of people got up and they walked away. Many disciples went back and walked with him. What? That was it. And I loved, I always loved that next verse. Jesus turned to Peter, James, and John, the 12 disciples, and you know what he said? You guys want to hit the road too? Peter, James, and John, y'all want to go? Bye-bye. <laughs> See what I loved about Jesus? He didn't have to have numbers to make him feel good about himself. He didn't have to feel spiritual because his church was 3,000 or 30. He knew what he was doing was right and true. And I can see him look at Peter, James, and John and says, listen, I'm going to build my church on truth. And if you guys want to follow that, then come with me. But if you don't, there's the door. I'll raise up 12 other men that are serious about the gospel of Christ. <laughs> How can you not love a guy that does that? And then you know the story. And Peter says, Lord, you alone have the... Words of life. I mean, I can't go back to Jack Daniels anymore. It didn't do it for me. <laughs> All right, you're going to get me preaching. I'll never get out of here. Okay, third. The third category. And this one becomes really hard. Our churches are really feel, uh, field, filled uh, with this one. Verse 7. And so as Jesus is throwing that... that uh, um, did I give the, I did give the answer to that one, didn't I? Or did I not? Yeah, right. They fall away due to tribulation and persecution and the cost for following him. These people in your churches, they're like shooting stars. Man, shooting stars is something brilliant to see. You ever seen a shooting star? Does it last for 
five weeks? Does it last for four hours that night? For like one or two seconds, right? Three seconds. People love to see a shooting star. And you see them in the church. They jump in and they start getting involved in everything. But then something quickly, and then they're, they're gone. And if they're your relative, you want to say that they're just backslidden, but deep in your heart you know there's no fruit. They never front slid to be backslid. They got emotionally saved, but not their spirit. Jesus was fun while it lasted. But like these whole groups of people when Jesus was preaching, when he didn't give them all they wanted. The rich young ruler, remember, he wanted Jesus. He wanted salvation, but he also wanted to keep his what? He wanted to keep all of that stash that he had. And Jesus said, make your choice. In your case, that's your God. That's your idol. Are you willing to give it up? And the guy said what? Yeah. Here's the third category, and this one is really tough. You might have a spouse, or this could be you. You might have a spouse, a parent, a child, a grandchild, a sibling, a best friend, or this could even possibly be you. Look at verse 7, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, and they what? This one's a little bit, you know, not quite the big rocks and stuff like that. Little thorns that get underneath the, you know, the root, and they start entwining themselves, right, with the root, and what's going to happen eventually? It's going to what? It's, it's going to choke it. Now, look and ask the Lord if this could possibly be you. These people, their sins aren't big and gross. In fact, oftentimes they're in church. Uh, in some churches, it could be 40, 50, 60 percent are like this. Other churches, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 percent. But man, they, on the outside, they, they really look like they're producing. That stock is going up, going up good. And on the outside, it looks okay. But there's some issues in their heart that they're not dealing with. There's those thorns in their heart, and that thorn is wrapping around Jesus, right? And Jesus, look, he tells you the reason these people fall away. And on the surface, it's really hard to, to sprout. You see that? You got the bird over here, and then you got the rock over there. But look in the background, you got the one. You got the thorns. Do we have a scripture verse up there? We got the next one? Put the next one up. Yeah. Uh, look at verse 22. He answers it. Sometimes I'll give you the one in Mark or Luke because they add a little bit of extra word or two to, to bring insight into this passage. Now, he who received the seed among the thorns in his heart, he is the guy who hears or the lady who hear or the youth who hears the word and look what causes him to fall. The what? What's the first thing? The what? What are some of the cares of the world? What, what, what are You can go ahead out loud and answer. Uh, say that again. Oh, okay, yeah, I guess that could be, yeah. Okay, politics. Huh? Finances, you're a parent or an adult and you're worried about, sure, we all do. All right, a couple of more. What are some worries that we all have? For what again? Fitting in. Fitting in. Oh, that's a care. I want to be accepted at my school. All right, let's get it. Let's go about three or four more. Nothing wrong with I'd like to move out of where I'm at into something a little nicer. That's a care. Will I be able to have enough money to move into this nice house, nicer furniture, upgrade my car? Is there anything sinful and wrong necessarily just with that? And the answer is no. no. Can you think of a few more cares? Say that again. Oh, okay. That's a good one. Yeah, I'm caring about having to hold on to all this. Yes, sweetheart. Say it again. Having good friends, that's the care. What if I have a friend that's kind of not real loyal to me? A couple more. Getting lobster and steak. Ooh, I'm ready to go to uh, Red Lobster. Getting lobster and steak, that is a concern. But that's a wishful dream for me that never happened. So I, I don't waste a lot of time without. Yes, Cherie. Caring for others. Okay, you're getting the point. The cares of this world cause these kind of people to quit seeking after God, quit getting involved deeply in the things of God, and they're beginning to spend all their time on what? 
those kind of things that you just talked about. Herb, I'd love to be there at church, but hey, my job is offering me double time if I work on a Sunday. So, you know, this year I won't be able to come to church on Sunday. God will understand. I remember telling one guy, oh, God will understand, all right. He'll understand that you're a sinner in sin. He'll understand you don't have faith. What do you mean God will understand? Where's, where does, that's what the word faith is about. <laughs> you can't trust God to meet your needs. That you're saying, I am not going to be in the house of the Lord this coming year because they pay me double. You know what a, you know what a prostitute is? It's somebody you can buy. I told a guy one time, look at me, buddy. I'm no prostitute. You can't buy me. And obviously, sir, you can be bought. And you know I'm speaking the truth. That's just the truth. Remember the Sabbath day to make double time. Herb, I might lose my job. And you know what? Maybe God wants you to get another job. You ever thought about that? Just maybe? <laughs> yeah, you can relate to that. The cares of this world. And then it says, you know what else causes these people to walk away from the Lord? Huh? What is it? Don't look at me. You can look at me, but I don't have it on my chest. Huh? The, uh, the deceitfulness of what? Causes these people, and they're oftentimes still in church. You ever see that funny, like a cartoon or something? And they'll have a, a, a horse or a, a, normally it's a burro or a donkey, and he's got this stick over his back, and there's a string, and on that string there's a carrot, and it's only about two feet away or a foot away from the donkey. And what does that get that donkey to do? Keep moving forward, right? Because he's hoping <laughs> with those droopy here. If you want to see it again, get the tape, because I'm not doing it a second time. <laughs> Hope you recorded that, Rob. But what, you're, what they're trying to motivate that dumb burro that doesn't want to work is that if he sees that carrot in front of him, he might get him some work out of it. And he'll keep running around, you know, plowing the field, hoping he's going to catch that carrot. And that's how Satan suckers millions in the church. He tells you money is the answer to your problem. I've told you guys jokingly over the decades... My wife and I have no money problems. You know why? We got no money. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to live. I mean, so, and it's this thought that money is going to make you happy. All you got to do is just turn on and look at Hollywood. Yeah. And half of them are in rehab programs. Three-fourths are divorced within 10 years. And if money was the answer to their problems, doggone it, why are they all getting divorced or all in, in these $5,000 a day rehab places? That money did not make them happy. There's a God-shaped vacuum in your heart that can only be filled by Christ and not the deceitfulness of riches. And if I'll just keep working harder and harder, and I'll get this promotion, and I'll get this, and then so what? So what? So you got a nicer car. So what? So you got a, th That's okay. There might be a place for that. But my friend, there is no joy or happiness and stuff and things. See, we are to love people and use things. What we do is we use people so that we can love things. And these people... Maybe it's you. You thought you got saved. But like people in Scripture, I think Judas is one of the best characters in Scripture. Boy, if you would talk to Miss Papa, Papa and Mama Judas, his parents, well, uh, the week weekend before uh, Jesus rode in Jerusalem, what would you think, what, what would they have said about their son to you? What do you think? Oh, he's a great, he's one of the 12. He is so trustworthy. They made him what? The they made him the treasure. And you'd have talked to his uncles and nephews and all of those kind of people. They would have all said, man, Judas is the real deal. He's given up everything to follow Jesus. But he had not given up everything to follow Jesus. When Jesus didn't do, hey, these Roman people have hurt my mom or dad or my uncle. They did this and that to them. Let's stick it to them and stop this Jesus turning your cheek and loving your enemies.
I don't know how many of you fit in this category, but the Word of God is getting choked out in your life by things like cares of the world. And people, listen, a lot of people, their idol is their children. They'll, get their, they'll wrap their whole lives around. They pick a church based upon what program can I, what church can I go to to get in and out that I can have the rest of Sunday to go to my baseball or soccer or football programs and not be late. Can you imagine Jesus doing that to, to Mary when he was eight years old? Hey, mom, I want to pay, play soccer select, find a good synagogue so I can be out of here by nine in the morning. Can you imagine Peter or Paul or John the Baptist and their wife trying to find a church and how quick they can get out? Are you out of your stinking mind? And churches, it's your fault for providing that for them. For having commercials. Hey, we know you're a busy person. And because you're busy, we have a service designed just for you to get you in and out. Stop it! Jesus never said, hey, on the Sermon on the Mount, I'm only going to do chapter 5 so I can get you out of here so I can get somebody else in. You're called to make a disciple, not a church member. What are we doing? Of course the average person doesn't want a full commitment to Christ, and you're offering them spiritual cotton candy. Ask a five-year-old kid, would you rather have broccoli, cauliflower, ice cream, and guess what 99 out of 100 will tell you? We're not supposed to give people what they want. We're supposed to give people what they need. You're like a doctor knowing a person has cancer and you're worried about hurting their feelings and so you don't tell them they got cancer. You'll be sued for malpractice and there'll be some preachers being sued for malpractice because you did not tell them the truth. And you know what I'm saying is right. Something in you is resonating. We have not made disciples of our nation. That's why this nation is in the position it's in. Not because of the White House, but because of God's house. We didn't raise up godly Daniels and Elijahs and Ezekiels and Esthers and Marys and Ruth who took a stand against wickedness. And if it cost them their life, so be it. And if it cost them to live a very poverty-stricken life, so be it. And you know what I'm saying is right. We've produced uh, tons of these kinds of people in our local churches. That if John the Baptist or Elijah or Paul came and preached or Jesus in their churches, well, in fact, they wouldn't because they wouldn't be allowed to. So in this last one, because I need to wrap it up here, they they begin to drift, and they drift in areas like cares of the world. I'd love to be their bud. I'd love to be their bud. Well, Herb, I'd love to be there. My kid. Listen, my, my family comes in. This is what I tell them. Mommy and Daddy, we're going to be at church. And if you, want, you do what you want to. But you know why? I love you, but I worship Jesus. We'll be at church. And if you don't want to come, we'll see you when we get back. We don't cater our whole life around our family. My family didn't die on the cross for my sins. Jesus did. And so they begin the cares of this world. Oh, I got to worry about their education and their college. You know what? Let God worry about that. You serve, you, you, you serve God with all of your heart. All right, so three, Roman numeral three, if you're a note taker in your outline, thorny ground, is ground that was never surrendered to Christ. The cares and the pleasures of this world and money eventually causes what? There was never any fruit. Look good, look promising at first. Okay, let's close with the last one then. And this is, this is the best one. Oh, do I have a couple of scripture verses? Do I, have first, do I have James 4 or 1 John up there? Aren't those great verses, right? James 4, adulterers, he, he calls them. You, you know what an adulterer is, right? Well, so you, do you know what a spiritual adulterer is? That means I've given my life to Christ. If I'm a spiritual adulterer, now I've also given my heart to the world. I'm committing adultery on God. By bringing another lover into my life. And that can be sports, recreation, that can be entertainment, that can be movies. All those have a place in life. We all need downtime. We all need a time to relax. But those become our life. Our children become our life. And we build our life around our children and not around the Lord anymore. You're, don't you, do you know that you should know this? Do you not know that being in friendship with the world is what? You're, you're an enemy of God. Whoever wants to be a friend of this world, why? 
And you don't want to correct the world. I'm not here to correct you when saying what you're doing is wrong. And then I have one more. Uh, I think there was first John, but don't worry about it. That's, that's enough to kind of get that, that point across. Let's go to the last one and we'll close here. Look at this is a great news, verse 8. But others fell on what? Good ground. And yielded a crop. Some what? 100, some 60, some 30. Person has ears to hear. I'm here. You're the person that uh, you've heard about Jesus. And however it happened over a short period of time, long period of time, you realize that, man, the world's not doing it for me. Money, nice cars, having a girl on my arm, all that stuff. There's something shallow. When I go to bed at night, I feel kind of trampy. I feel junky. You know, I feel kind of used. There's, you know, and, and you get to that point quick. You, you don't do that for 20 or 30 years. All of a sudden, you just feel something not right. There's something not right about not being wholesome and right and pure in those areas. And, and, and God speaks to you. And, and, and you respond to the Lord. Let me just close with an illustration right here on this one. Fall on good ground. It's not that you're a good person. I said, God made your heart tender at that moment. I was, we were doing street ministry before you came to New Home. And uh, I was sharing on the Friday night at the Gospel Mission. And when I finished, there was a couple of Spanish guys. And I could tell when I asked about who wanted to give their life to Christ, I did it in Spanish. And one of the Spanish guys raised his hand, right? And he was from Cuba. In fact, they were both, I believe, from Cuba. And so at the end, I said, okay, and we finished praying. I said, I want you to come and I'll pray. And so my Spanish, my, my Bible Spanish was really rough 30-something uh, years ago. It's not much better now. And so his friend came forward. His friend's name was Luis. I don't remember the guy's name anymore, but I remember his friend's name. And he said, yo hablo los dos lenguas. I speak both languages. I hermano, me ayuda. Help me a little bit here. So, uh, so rather than try to, I know I forgot the word for, you know, sin, pecado, basic stuff, right? So I said, be a lot quicker. I'll say it in English. You translate. So this Luis guy translated to that guy. said, you're ready to give your life to Christ. You understand. And, and this guy said, yeah, yeah. And apparently he was like a Seventh-day Adventist. That was his background. So I explained it to the guy. He shakes his head. Yes, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. And so I tell Luis, I said, Luis, and, and, you know, translate this prayer. And so as this guy named Luis, who came forward just to help his friend out, is translating, he starts crying. Luis starts crying and crying and crying, right? And I thought, I know I put deodorant on. I'm thinking, well, how could I bum the guy out? So Luis starts crying, and he interprets it, and the guy prays the prayer, and it, wonderful, and we try to get the guy a Bible and the next, within two weeks, we, I don't see that guy anymore. But guess who I saw over the next couple of weeks? Luis. And Luis started coming. And Luis, started, and all of a sudden, it took me a while to realize, I don't know if this guy just was desperate in America, needing a place to stay, was in trouble with the law, wanted a Jesus to get him out of his dire circumstances. But Luis wound up being the guy that got saved. <laughs> Let me just tell you a long story short. Luis slipped back, and he started getting into selling drugs. And Joanne, you'll remember this. He, uh, some sort of bad drug deal, and uh, he comes over to the house late at night, knocks on the door, and he got a bullet hole shot right through his upper thigh. And he said, Herb, Pastor Herb, Pastor Herb. And so, you know, we wrapped everything. Come on, let's go to the hospital. No, no, no. So apparently he knew if he went to the hospital, you know, he would get nailed or, or they'd be waiting for him. And so we nursed him back to health for quite a while. And he had some debts to pay. Long story short, we moved to Elizabethtown in 1992. I get a phone call. Luis has the opportunity to go to, I've never heard of this, a different kind of jail. One was in Kentucky. He says, I know Pastor Herb moved to Kentucky. So if I'd go to Kentucky, maybe Pastor Herb will see me. Well, the guy goes to the jail in Ashland, like a mile or two from West Virginia. So I think I went once. I don't think I went twice. But I mean, it's not like a 20-minute drive. It's like, what, three hours or so one way? So we go, and Luis says, now he's saved, but now he's got a debt to pay. Just because you get saved doesn't mean all your debts are gone. And so he got saved, and he told me he, when they were loading him up, he was coming up from Glendale, that he actually saw me in the parking lot. What are the odds of that? 
That's how, that's how he says, man, i got to get old Pastor Herb. Long, long, long story short, this guy gets serious about the Lord, gets out, goes back to Fort Worth where he's from, starts playing the bass guitar at his church, starts getting uh, really serious. And then he says, Herb, I think God's calling me back to Cuba. He was from Cuba. Now, I'm trying to put this in a way that it won't even come close to help you to understand. Imagine being from the nicest neighborhood in East Louisville, right? I don't know where the nicest neighborhood is, but wherever they have the million-dollar homes. And now you decide to move into the worst part of West Louisville. I mean, the absolutely worst block in West, West Louisville. How many are with your wife and kids? Raise your hand. You're willing to do that right now. Come on. Don't give me the, oh, yes, I would. So he said, Herb, God's calling me back to Cuba, to Havana, the capital. And uh, so you're going to leave the comforts of the United States and go back to a nation. And you know how he got here in the first place? He was a political prisoner. See, some of you, we're so naive. You understand that some of these guys in these countries are emptying their prisons of murders and their rapists, and they're putting them at the border. You do understand that, right? They're not stupid. In, in, in Honduras and Mexico and all these big cities, you think they want to keep feeding those kind of people and letting them back into the, out into their community? And they will empty their prisons and they will put them at the border. And we're so stupid by not vetting, but that's a whole nother sermon. And he was a political prisoner. In other words, he disagreed with Fidel. He said, you know, Mr. Castro, this communism, you, you, you misled us, you lied to us, so they locked him up. They, so now he's willingly going back to his country, knowing anything could happen. A lot of you don't know, we took him on as a bishop to support, but he caught, during COVID, he caught whatever he caught. And, oh, Cuba has free medical care. Yeah, you think they have the most upgraded medical facilities? And he was only in the hospital for a couple of months, and he didn't make it. 50-something-year-old man gave up his life going back to uh, Castro to reach his people. That's good ground. <laughs> that, that, that's a ground. This is, I could have stayed in the United States. They would have had a good job. He had Fort Worth, this big factory. That's good ground. If you're producing 30, produce more. Do more for the Lord. You, you got a few more years left. Some of us have three, five, seven, 20, whatever we have left. Produce 60. And if you're producing 60, produce 90 or 100. Do everything you can for the glory of God.